Hey guys, welcome to Lingua Marina. Today we're going to talk about the TOEFL test. As you know, I've taken it twice. The first time was in 2015, the second time was in 2020, and I scored over 110 each time I took it. The first time I scored 117. The second time was a little bit less. I think it was 115 or 114. Anyways, in this video, you'll find comprehensive practice tests for the listening and speaking sections. And we'll also talk about preparing for TOEFL in less than a month. And by the way, guys, TOEFL prep is not really about learning a language. TOEFL prep is all about making sure you understand how the test works, making sure you understand the tasks, making sure you actually take a practice test because you need to be able to function when you're stressed, when there is a time constraint, when everyone around you, if you're taking the offline version, everyone around you is freaking out, they're taking the test. I've been there. I know that, you know, the actual test is so different from everything you do at home, but everything you do at home is actually really, really helpful. So let's dive right into it. Please welcome a TOEFL test. If you have four weeks until your TOEFL test, watch this video carefully because these four weeks can change the whole trajectory. You have to be wise about them. You have to do things that I'm going to talk about in this video to make sure you feel great during the exam, to make sure you're confident during the exam, because all of this is really important for you to pass the TOEFL test and score whatever you need to score. Now, your situation is better than mine because when I found out that I had to take TOEFL, I also found out that I had to take GMAT. And the GMAT test is much more complicated than TOEFL. So my study plan looked like this. Get ready for GMAT. And if you have some time left, get ready for TOEFL. So I only had 10 days to prepare for the TOEFL test. But the good news is, even if you only have two weeks, if you only have one week, this video is still going to be very useful for you. Now let's talk about the plan that worked for me, worked for the students who watched this channel, and worked for the students who took a TOEFL course. Week number one. You have six items on the list. Item number one, get acquainted with the test. Make sure you know that it has four parts, that they're gonna check your reading, writing, listening, and speaking skills, that there are different types of questions in every section, that there are several types of essays that you're gonna write, that there are several things that you should pay attention to when you're doing the listening section. So this is your chance to make sure that you understand what the TOEFL test looks like. Task number two, and this is super important, get acquainted with the strategies that would help you answer questions in the TOEFL test. The thing is, there are strategies for every section. For example, the reading section includes three, four passages with 10 questions each, and you have 54 to 72 minutes, depending on how lucky you are, depending on how many questions you got, to answer all of them. And there are different types of questions, purpose, reference, vocabulary, and so on. And there are different strategies for each question. For example, to answer rhetorical purpose questions, you read the question first, you don't really look at the answers, you go and find the paragraph in the reading section, you start looking for the keyword that's in the question, then you read one or two sentences that come before the sentence with that keyword, and those sentences would normally contain the answer. The thing is, the TOEFL test is like maths. You need to know the strategies, you need to know how to answer each type of question, because sometimes the texts are so complicated and you just get lost. Like for me, those strategies were game changers. My English was pretty good at the time I took the TOEFL test and I was able to score 117 out of 120. But what I think is that without those strategies, my grade could have been 100 or even 90, because this is how much knowing those strategies affects your performance. Task number three. Find someone who's gonna give you feedback. Now, getting ready for the TOEFL test by watching videos on YouTube is a really good strategy, and I've made over 10 videos about this test myself. However, the problem is, with the videos, you're not getting any feedback. For example, if you're doing your speaking section, there's no one to rate your answer, 
or if you're writing an essay, there is no one to read your essay. When I was preparing for my TOEFL test, I actually asked my American friend to look over my essays and he found some mistakes, but because he wasn't trained to check TOEFL essays, he couldn't give me feedback regarding structure, regarding usage of more advanced vocabulary. And this is why I would recommend finding a teacher who specializes in the TOEFL test. At LinguaTrip, we have a TOEFL course where Anastasia, a professional English language teacher who actually scored 119 on the test, she can provide feedback on all of your tasks. She has been preparing students for this exam for over 10 years, so she knows nearly everything about TOEFL. This course has 30 video lessons that are dedicated to each section, reading, listening, writing, and speaking. And in those videos, we share exam hacks, we share strategies, we give you templates and provide you with different approaches to dealing with each exam task. So if you want personal feedback on your speaking and writing section, please make sure to select the Guru package where Anastasia is gonna provide personal feedback. And don't forget to use the promo code LINGUAMARINA to get a special discount. The link is down in the description box. Task number four is for you to take a practice test. I recommend you take it in one sitting, just like on your TOEFL test day just because the exam lasts for three hours with a short break between the listening and the speaking sections and things get stressful you need to make sure you had enough to eat you use the restroom like all of that stuff but also you need to learn how to stay focused for three hours straight and again, I am glad the reading section comes first because this is where you have to be as sharp as possible if you can regulate this but it is just so hard you need to be really focused on your reading section like pay attention to every single word because it's super intense it, it gets easier with listening but it's still kind of intense and then i think writing is more about your creativity and being attentive versus you know paying attention to every single thing that's going on it's it's more relaxing so i'm actually glad that the test flows the way it flows it starts with the reading section then goes on to the listening section then short break then speaking and writing and then you're done number five analyze your weaknesses and strengths after you take your practice test and by the way you can take it on the website ets.org this is the official organization behind the toefl test and um, what they're gonna do they're actually gonna show you all of the questions that you got right or wrong so you would actually get your points for the reading and for the listening sections and uh, the maximum that you can get on those sections is 30 so you will see whether it's like 20 out of 30 or 15 out of 30. unfortunately if you don't have a teacher or if you're not enrolled in the course there won't be any feedback on your writing and speaking sections but at least you will be able to practice doing all of them in one sitting now after the practice test i want you to analyze your feelings what was the most difficult thing if you're striving for 100 out of 120 on your toefl test then you would need to score at least 25 points on each section right what if you scored 15 out of 30 on your reading section this is where you draw conclusions about what was the most difficult thing for you and then you build the whole preparation process around focusing on the most difficult part first so if reading was the most difficult part then you start every day every class with the reading part and then you move on to the sections that were easier for you and this is basically task number six start focusing on your weaknesses if your weakness is the reading section then do it over and over again find more practice tests find more exercises just do them over and over again now week two is all about practicing and working on your weaknesses task number one dedicate one day to each section and start with your weakness take at least two practice tests for that specific section for reading and listening, review the wrong answers and practice the types of questions where you made mistakes. For speaking and writing, pay attention to how much extra help 
you need with grammar and vocabulary. For example, if you think about a word during your writing section, you're like, I really want to use this word, but I forgot its spelling and I actually need to use my dictionary. Now, this is what you pay attention to because you can't use a dictionary during your TOEFL test. You rely on your memory. And so you do this every day. Monday, two reading sections. Tuesday, two listening sections. Uh, Wednesday, two speaking sections. Thursday, two writing sections, Friday, two reading sections, and I will still work on the weekend um, so that you have more practice. When I was preparing for my TOEFL, those 10 days, oh my God, they were so intense. I think I spent maybe four to five hours each day just working on my TOEFL test. During this week, you would also need to start working on your vocabulary my philosophy here is that you won't be able to learn English in a month, right? You just can't. So TOEFL will reflect your current knowledge of English. But what I also want you to do is to brush up some idioms and vocabulary that you could potentially use in your writing section. Just because when they check that section, they specifically look for more advanced vocabulary. I was never able to score 30 out of 30 on my writing section just because I, I'm more on the careful side. I only try to use words uh, that I'm 150% sure of. Like I know their meaning, I know how to spell them. And if something sounds a bit unfamiliar to me, I wouldn't just use it. You can just Google like top 100 words for TOEFL writing or TOEFL speaking. Select 10 words every day. Those could be words and phrases that you know already. Uh, it's just for you to brush them up and uh, make sure that you use some of them in your writing section. We actually asked a couple of native speakers to take the TOEFL test and uh, I don't know anyone who scored 30 out of 30 on writing. So our teacher who's a native speaker scored 29 out of 30. This is how tricky it is. Like for me, reading, listening, and speaking, they're like maths. Writing is a little bit more creative. So it's just really hard for a student to get 30 out of 30. But still possible, people do that. Then the next task is for you to create your templates and to learn them, to memorize them, so that you can use them during your test. And there are templates for each question uh, in the speaking section, and there are templates for the essays in the writing section. And task number 10 in our overall list of tasks is to again review your wrong answers. Figure out why you got it wrong and what you could do to avoid answering those types of questions incorrectly in the future. Week three, TOEFL is coming. So this week it's all about practice, practice, and practice. One day, one section. And this is where you also start timing yourself. You only have 18 minutes to complete every passage in the reading section. So 18 minutes, no more, no less. And I say no less because if you do everything in 15 minutes, then go back and check your answers. That strategy saved me on my TOEFL test because when I went back, I realized I actually answered one question incorrectly and I changed my answer. And this is what got me to 30 out of 30 on the reading section. So timing yourself is what you're focusing on during your third week of TOEFL prep. And again, you focus on your weaknesses and more vocabulary, 10 words and phrases each day. Try to make sentences with them. Try to select your favorite words and phrases and make sure that you actually use them in your writing and in your speaking sections. And uh, week number four, I actually recommend you go to the place where you're going to take your TOEFL just to figure out the whole transportation situation, how busy it gets with the traffic, how long it takes you to get there, um, what's the parking situation, all of that. Now this week you stop learning the new vocabulary, you just review what you've learned because you don't want to learn any new words that you don't have time to practice because they can actually distract you during your TOEFL test. Take a couple of full practice tests in two sittings, so one sitting per test, just to mimic the whole experience. But don't do that a day before your actual test. The day before your actual test, you rest. You watch a movie in English. Kind of surround yourself with the atmosphere because I also remember I was taking my, I took my TOEFL in Russia. So I was surrounded by 
the Russian language every single day. And I wanted to get into those English language uh, vibes just before the test. So I watched some movies, I started uh, speaking English to myself, just to switch on this English speaking mode in my head. Now I just want to repeat this. You need to rest the day before the test. Because if you're nervous, if you didn't sleep well, if you didn't eat well, this is going to affect you because this is a really high stress environment and you need to be as calm as possible because this is the only way you can focus. And again, you won't be able to learn English in four weeks. You won't be able to learn English in a week, but during four weeks, you're able to get acquainted with the test, get into the right mindset, relax, and also remember that this is not the end of your life. If you don't score what you need to score, you can take the test as many times as you want. Yes, it is not free, but life is not over if you didn't score whatever you needed. But I am pretty sure you're gonna do well on the first attempt. Fingers crossed for you guys. All of the resources that I mentioned are gonna be linked down below in the description box. Quick addition. I think you need a list of phrasal verbs. Phrasal verbs, the ones that you cannot translate, so you have to learn them. And uh, in TOEFL, not only would you hear them in every single section, but the test makers expect you to use them in the writing section. So you really need to be good with phrasal verbs. You need to know what they are, how to use them, when to use them, and not mix them up. So we created a free PDF with phrasal verbs that are useful for TOEFL and not just for TOEFL because we're not learning English just to take TOEFL, we learn English to improve our lives. The PDF is down below, it's completely free. Please download it, please take notes of all the phrasal verbs that are new for you. Print it out, highlight the phrasal verbs with a highlighter, the ones that you don't know, and learn them and start using them. The PDF is free, the link is down below. Feel free to download it and start practicing right away. Today I'm excited to go through the listening part together with you. So one of the most important things in the listening section is that you are allowed to take notes. And this is a game changer. You have to take notes. And uh, the skill that you need to practice, like a lot of people are like, oh, I need to prepare for my listening section, etc. The number one skill that you need to work on when you're preparing for your TOEFL test is actually note taking. If you can write down all the details that you hear during the listening section, then there is a 100% chance you can answer all the questions. Taking notes. So first of all, there is this home test, TOEFL home test experience. And it's in terms of like note taking, it was the worst for me because when you're actually taking a test in a test center, you are using a real piece of paper with a real pencil so you can write things down. When you're at home, you need to put your piece of paper into a folder, like a transparent file, and uh, write with a marker on it. And because with a marker, your font tends to be bigger, you just run out of space and you're not really used to writing on this slippery surface with a marker. So that was like one of the disadvantages of taking the test from home. They want you to use this transparent file because they want you to erase everything after the test and you can only have one transparent file. So you can only use two of the sides without like erasing stuff during the exam without erasing stuff constantly. No, that was really hard for me because I couldn't take all the notes I wanted to take just because I was running out of space. So if you're taking your TOEFL test from home, get yourself a really thin marker um, to just have more space there. And um, note taking is about really taking notes of every single detail. Like first time uh, when I scored 30 out of 30 on listening, I took notes of everything every color that they named, every student, every date. And that helped me so much because the questions that you see after the text, they're like, they're asking for such small things that the author mentioned. And I was like, how was I supposed to memorize all of that? You need to take notes during listening. And the more notes you take, the more successful you are during your listening section. So try to write everything. That was my approach. But you can only do that if you're a good note taker. If you're not a good note taker, that would only distract you. So if you feel that you can't really take notes quickly, then don't take a lot of notes, just uh, write down some dates. But the best strategy that worked for me is basically writing down the whole text. 
I use some contractions, like I, I studied mathematics at the university and for any, we had this sign and more, less, like all of the mathematical signs, I use them all the time. And uh, if you practice note taking at home, you can come up with some signs for yourself that you can use. If you're a mathematician, then uh, congrats. You will know a lot of signs that you can use in your note taking. If you study to be a journalist, you probably have this skill as well. Maybe watch some videos on note taking, watch some videos on how you can contract while you're writing. Because again, this skill, it helps in listening, it helps in speaking, because in speaking you would also listen to someone talking about a topic and then you will need to give your opinion. In writing, they don't help too much because you're typing. In writing, something that really helps if you're taking the exam in a test center, just getting used to different keyboards because they use really old keyboards in those test centers with like those huge, huge I'm, I'm just used to my laptop and it's like very thin. Uh, but anyways, you need to learn how to take notes in English. And going back to the keyboard, if you could learn how to type faster, if you could learn how to touch type without looking at your keyboard, that would also be really useful. And this skill would stay with you for your whole life. Because sometimes I feel like when I'm talking about all of those exams, I just feel that, well, it's just it just takes too much time to fare. But then I realize like note taking skill is a great skill. Touch typing skill is a great skill. It's gonna stay with you throughout your life. So learn that as well. And if you have plenty of time before your TOEFL test, start with those two skills because they would enhance your day-to-day -day life as well. The way that TOEFL works, you enter the classroom, you do your reading section, which is gonna exhaust you, I promise. It is a very intense section. So take your time before the listening section, take a couple of deep breaths, you know, forget about your reading section, let it go, stop thinking about the answers that you might've gotten wrong. It is fine, it's okay, you probably got everything right. You're doing great. Now is the time to let everything go and focus on your listening session. So breathe in, breathe out. Before we start, guys, please make sure you have paper and please make sure you have a pen or a pencil so we can practice together. For this video, I'm using an official free practice listening section on um, ETS.org website. ETS is the company that created TOEFL. So you're gonna be given directions at the beginning of your listening section. These directions are available online. Read them before the test so that again, you can take these two minutes while they're reading them out loud and breathe and relax and make sure you're, you know, you're all ready to, to take notes. And then we're going to click continue. Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Hi, Professor Mason. Do you have a minute? Yes, of course, Eric. I think there was something I wanted to talk to you about, too. Probably my late essay. Ah, that must have been it. I thought maybe I'd lost it. No, I'm sorry. Actually, it was my computer that lost it, the first draft of it. And, well, anyway, I finally put it in your mailbox yesterday. Oh, and I haven't checked the mailbox yet today. Well, I'm glad it's there. I'll read it this weekend. Well, sorry again. Say, I can send it to you by email, too, if you like. Great. I'll be interested to see how it all came out. Right. Now, um, I just overheard some graduate students talking. Something about a party for Dean Adams? A retirement party, yes. All students are invited. Wasn't there a notice on the anthropology department's bulletin board? Uh, I don't know, but I wanted to offer to help out with it. You know, whatever you need. Dean Adams, well, I took a few anthropology classes with her, and they were great, inspiring. And, well, I just wanted to pitch in. Oh, that's very thoughtful of you, Eric, but it'll be pretty low-key. Nothing flashy. That's not her style. So there's nothing? No, we'll have coffee and cookies. Maybe a cake, but actually a couple of the administrative assistants are working on that. You could ask them, but I think they've got it covered. Okay. Actually, oh, no, never mind. What is it? Well, it's nothing to do with the party, and I'm sure there are more exciting ways you could spend your time. But we do need some help with something. We're compiling a database of articles the anthropology faculty has published. <laughs> There's not much glory in it, but we're looking for someone with some knowledge of anthropology who can enter the articles. I hesitate to mention it, but I don't suppose this is something you would... No, that sounds kind of cool. I'd like to see what they're writing about. Wonderful. And there are also some unpublished studies. D did you know Dean Adams did a lot of field research in Indonesia? M most of it hasn't been published yet. No, like what? Well, she's really versatile. She just spent several months studying social interactions in Indonesia, and she's been influential in ethnology. 
Oh, and she's also done work in South America that's closer to biology, especially with speciation. Uh, not to seem uninformed. Well, how species form. Y- you know, how two distinct species form from one, like when populations of the same species are isolated from each other and then develop in two different directions and end up as two distinct species. Interesting. Yes. And while she was there in South America, she collected a lot of linguistic information and songs. Really fascinating. Well, I hate to see her leave. Don't worry. She'll still be around. She's got lots of projects that she's still in the middle of. That was hard. Why does the man go to see the professor? Did you answer? Number one is super tempting. Uh, Because the conversation starts with handing in the assignment. But actually, this is a conversation starter because he mentions it and he mentions it's already in the mailbox, etc. It's just a small talk. Then he starts talking about wanting to help with Dean's... Where are my notes? With Dean's retirement party. So the right answer here is actually to volunteer to help organize the event. So this is the thing with TOEFL listening. They're going to try to confuse you. So make sure while taking notes, and I took um, two sheets of notes, very, you know, very basic, trying to catch some words that I might forget. But It's also important to catch the overall detail of the conversation. And this is the question about the overall detail. How did the man learn about Dean Adams' retirement? I actually wrote it down. He said something about um, students discussing this event. So he heard other students discussing it. Okay, next. Again, that was, this is kind of clear. So this is a very clear um, Why does the professor refuse the man's offer to help with the party? Okay, here we need two answers. Two people are already working on it. She didn't mention the number, actually. She prefers that he spend his time on the project. The party doesn't require much preparation. There, remember, they had this phrase, it's going to be a very low-key event. Uh, Low-key event means nothing special is going to happen. And, you know, they try to insert those EDMs in your TOEFL test to make sure you understand them. But they also kind of explained this low-key. They said it's going to be just coffee and cookies. So... Don't be afraid that you need to know all the idioms for your TOEFL because normally they would have some kind of explanation that you would just need to catch. Dean Adams is not permanently leaving the department. This is true, but this is not why she didn't want to help his help. I don't remember about two people, but this answer here, like I think this, this answer number four, they're trying to confuse us. Okay, this is hard. I would say two people are already working on it because when the professor mentioned that Dean Adams is not permanently leaving the department, she was like, because the, the student said, I'm going to miss her, but she's like, no, don't, don't worry. She's not permanently leaving the department. So it wasn't about the party. Okay. Yay. We're correct. That was tricky. I'm glad we had this discussion with you regarding the right answer because this is how you, you know, this is how you think because I wasn't sure about the two people. I don't remember. I remember... She said administrative assistants are working on it. Maybe she said a couple. I don't remember. I didn't write that down either. But I remember that, you know, they never discussed him spending time on another project. And I'm pretty sure it's not number four. So I'm glad we did that. Okay, the next question. Why does the professor talk about speciation? Oh, that was hard because there was so much terminology. And so many words that I don't really use in my normal life. But the thing is, the question asks general about the general information, like why they actually talked about it. It doesn't ask you what speciation means. Okay, (laughs) speciation. To describe the main focus of the work she needs help with? No. To tell a man, the man about a new research area? No. Okay, to explain what Dean Adams chose to work on in Indonesia, to demonstrate how varied um, Dean Adams' research has been. Again, number three and number four seem legit. Now let's talk about what we're going to choose. So I remember from the conversation that this is what Dean Adams used to work on in Indonesia. 
But the whole conversation about speciation in Indonesia actually started because she wanted to show the student how different, how exciting the work of the professor was because she was initially like, I don't want you to help with the database because it's going to be, you know, just uh, manually entering articles in the database. But then she's like, by the way, she did this amazing research in, research in Indonesia that wasn't published. So again, the general, the more general idea was to demonstrate how varied Dean Adams' research has been. Like there was no need to explain what she was doing in Indonesia because it was part of this explanation how varied Dean Adams' research has been. Again, this is a very, very tricky question because number three is still right. So she, expl she was explaining what um, Dean Adams was doing in Indonesia. But again, the purpose was not to explain because the student never asked for it. The purpose was to excite him about helping them with the database. Oh my God, complicated. Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. There's not much glory in it, but we're looking for someone with some knowledge of anthropology who can enter the articles. I hesitate to mention it, but I don't suppose this is something you would... Why does the professor say this? I hesitate to mention it, but I don't suppose this is something you would... Well, let's answer this question without reading the options. Why does she say that? Because she thinks this project is not too exciting. She's kind of apologizing. And the next phrase would be she, she's asking him to join the project. Interesting. To expre 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 express doubt? No. To ask the man if he would be willing to work on the project? Yes. This, this was the starting phrase to ask him. To ask the man to recommend someone for the project. Did she ask? I don't think so. It wasn't even in this part. Okay. To apologize for not being able to offer the... No. To ask the man if he would be willing to join. Correct. Okay. So how was the first part? Difficult? Doable? The thing is, when we talk about TOEFL prep, there are certain tactics and mechanics that you learn that make the whole experience easier. You won't really learn English while preparing for the test because, you know, it's, it's a different conversation. It's a different topic. But test prep is actually super important because you know what to expect. You know all the mind hacks that will help you. Now let's move on to the next task. Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. So that's how elephants use infrasound. Now let's talk about the other end of the acoustical spectrum, sound that's too high for humans to hear, ultrasound. Ultrasound is used by many animals that detect, and some of them send out very high-frequency sounds. So what's a good example? Yes, Carol? Well, bats. Since they're all blind, bats have to use sound for, uh, you know, to keep from flying into things. That's echolocation. Echolocation is pretty self-explanatory. Using echoes, reflected sound waves, to locate things. As Carol said, bats use it for navigation and orientation. And what else? Mike? Well, finding food is always important. And, uh, I guess, not becoming food for other animals. <laughs> right, on both counts. Avoiding other predators and locating prey. Um, typically insects that fly around at night. Now, before I go on, let me just respond to something Carol was saying, this idea that bats are blind. Actually, there are some species of bats, the ones that don't use echolocation, that do rely on their vision for navigation. But it is true that for many bats, their vision is too weak to count on. Okay, so quick summary of how echolocation works. The bat emits these ultrasonic pulses, very high-pitched sound waves that we can't hear. And then they analyze the echoes, how the waves bounce back. Uh, here, let me finish this diagram I started before class. So the bat sends out these pulses, very focused bursts of sound, and echoes bounce back. You know, I don't think I need to draw in the echoes. You're, you're reading assignment for the next class. It has a diagram that shows this very clearly. So anyway, as I was saying, 
By analyzing these echoes, the bat can determine, say, if there's a wall in a cave that it needs to avoid, and how far away it is. Another thing it uses ultrasound to detect is the size and shape of objects. For example, one echo they'd quickly identify is the one they associate with a moth, which is common prey for a bat, particularly a moth beating its wings. However, moths happen to have a major advantage over most other insects. They can detect ultrasound. This means that when a bat approaches, the moth can detect the bat's presence, so it has time to escape to safety, or else they can just remain motionless. Since、um, when they stop beating their wings, they'd be much harder for the bat to distinguish from, oh,、uh, a leaf or or some other object. Now we've tended to underestimate just how sophisticated the abilities of animals that use ultrasound are. In fact, we kind of assumed that they were filtering a lot out,、uh, the way a sophisticated radar system can ignore echoes from stationary objects on the ground. Radar does this to remove ground clutter. Information about、um, hills or buildings that it doesn't need, but bats. We thought they were filtering out this kind of information because they simply couldn't analyze it. But it looks as if we were wrong. Recently, there was this experiment with trees and a specific species of bats, a bat called the lesser spear-nosed bat. Now, a tree should be a huge acoustical challenge for a bat, right? I mean, it's got all kinds of surfaces with different shapes and angles. So, well, the echoes from a tree are going to be a mass of chaotic acoustic reflections, right? Not like the echo from a moth. So, we thought for a long time that bats stopped their evaluation at simply, "That's a tree." Yet, it turns out that that bats, or at least this particular species, can not only tell that it's a tree. But can also distinguish between, say, a pine tree and a deciduous tree, like a maple or an oak tree, just by their leaves. And when I say leaves, I mean pine needles too. Any ideas on how it would know that? Well, like with the moth, could it be their shape? You're on the right track. It's actually the echo off all the leaves as a whole that matters. Now think. A pine tree with all those little densely packed needles; those produce a large number of faint reflections in what's what's called a, a smooth echo. The waveform is very even. But an oak, which has fewer but bigger leaves with stronger reflections, produces a jagged waveform, or what we call a rough echo. And these bats can distinguish between the two, and not just with trees. But with any echo that comes in a smooth or rough shape, what is the lecture mainly about? Oh my God. Okay. How animals emit ultrasonic pulses? How bats use acoustic signals? A comparison of echolocation radar? No. Variations about bats and use of no. Again, the general question here: What is the lecture mainly about? Pay attention to mainly, guys. One quick thing: when you're doing your listening test, you have to be 150% present. Like if you're thinking about a chocolate, if you're thinking about lunch or something else, you're gonna miss details and you're gonna miss key words in a question. Now here we're looking at a question: What is the lecture mainly about? So in general, the lecture is about ultrasound. And how animals communicate. They talk about bats, and they also mention elephants. But again, we're talking about mainly. What is the lecture mainly about? And mainly, we heard about bats using acoustical sounds. Why does the professor decide not to add more information to the diagram on the board? I knew they're gonna ask this. But the thing is, when they have this. Small conversation that is not related to the topic. That is about something general, like oh, I'm not going to show you this diagram because you're going to get this assignment. Try to write that down because, and I did it like next assignment. Show that diagram, and she's not going to do it because there is 100% chance there's going to be a question about it. 
So why does the professor decide not to add more information to the diagram? She wants students to complete the diagram that's themselves an assignment. She needs to look up some information in order to complete the diagram. No, the additional information is not relevant to the topic. I'll say this. Um, I was kind of hesitant about this because uh, I don't really quite remember the details. Again, if you don't have a clear answer right away, try to go through every option and uh, eliminate the options that you don't like. I'm glad we have all the time in the world when we're doing the test practice. Um, again, just practice those skills. She wants students to complete the diagram of themselves as an assignment. I don't remember that. I think she, she said that there was something in the textbook. She needs to look up some information. No, this is not true. Additional information is not relevant to the topic that she wants to discuss next. Not really. So four would be the right answer. Okay, next. According to the professor, what are two ways in which a moth might react when it detects the presence of a bat? Okay, the moth might stop beating its wings. Yes, she mentioned that. The moth might emit high frequency if that sounds no. The moth might leave the area. Yes. The moth might change its color to match the I think it's pretty clear. Yeah, okay. That was easy, right? Because they do not emit high frequency sounds and the moth may change its color. Nothing about that. Okay. What surprising information did a recent experiment reveal about lesser spear-nosed bats? Oh, lesser spear-nosed bats. They went ahead and they talked about... There we go. They talk, Also, try to enumerate your papers because I didn't enumerate them and I don't know which comes first but I think this was one this was two this was this was two this was three anyway just to know where you are with your notes okay they filter out echoes they can analyze echoes from stationary objects with complex surfaces they can analyze jagged echoes that's not true they cannot analyze echoes from certain types of small no uh, the, the whole thing was about they can analyze echoes from stationary objects with complex surfaces because they can sur surfaces because they can yeah tell what kind of tree they have in front According of them. According to the professor, why does a pine tree produce a smooth echo? Because there are many pines. Because it has a smooth trunk. No, it has large branches spaced at regular intervals. No. Yeah, it has many small, densely packed needles. Correct. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Now, before I go on, let me just respond to something Carol was saying. This idea that bats are blind. Why does the professor say this? Now, before I go on, let me just respond to something Carol was saying. That was the moment when I kind of faded away. <laughs> um, so here I would choose the second one because I remember she was like, oh, not, every, not all bats are blind, something like that. And that is correct. Okay. Listen to a conversation between a student and a registrar. Uh, hi, I'd like to drop off my graduation form. I understand you need this in order to process my diploma. Okay, I'll take that. Um, before you leave, let me check our computer. Uh, looks like you're okay for graduation. And, hmm, actually I'm getting a warning flag on your academic record here. Really? Yeah, let's see what's what. Uh, okay, are you familiar with our graduation requirements? Uh, I think so. Well, then you know you need 48 credits in your major field to graduate and at least 24 credits at the intermediate level or higher. Also, after your second year, you have to meet with your department chair to outline a plan for the rest of your time here. In the past, we also issued letters before a student's final year began to let them know what they needed to take in their final year to be okay, but we don't do that anymore. I definitely met with my chairperson two years ago. Uh, he told me that I needed eight more courses at the intermediate level or higher in the last two years to be okay. Uh, so, I'm not sure what the problem is. I, I made sure I got those credits. Unfortunately, the computer's usually pretty reliable. So, I'm not sure what's going on here. It could be that I've taken two basic courses, but coupled both of them with uh, field experiences. 
What do you mean? Well, I could only take intro courses because there were no intermediate level courses available for those particular topics. My chairperson told me that if I did independent field research in addition to the assigned work in each course,、uh, they would count as intermediate level courses.、Uh, my classmates,、um, well, some of my classmates did this for an easy way to meet their intermediate course requirement,、uh, but I did it to get the kind of depth in those topics I was going for. As it turned out, I really enjoyed the field work. It was a nice supplement to just sitting and listening to lectures. I'm sure that's true, but the computer's still showing them as basic level courses, despite the field work.、Uh, I'm not sure what to do then. I, I mean, should I cancel my graduation party? No, no reason to get worried like that. Just contact your chairperson immediately, okay?、Uh, tell him to call me as soon as possible so that we can verify your field work arrangement and certify those credits right away. It's not like there's an actual deadline today or anything, but if more than a few weeks go by, we might have a real problem that would be very difficult to fix in time for you to graduate. In fact, there probably would be nothing we could do. I'll get on that. Okay, to drop off the graduate form. Yeah, to submit a document required for graduation. I just wanted to tell you guys. Then, whenever it's.、Um, A conversation that is not a lecture. I was like, "Oh, when is my graduation party?" Or some super relaxed, like conversation, general conversation about student life. So it's when you relax. I'm glad、um, we got it last. Okay. Yes. According to the registrar, what step is currently taken to ensure that students fulfill their graduation requirements? Academic records are checked. No. Okay. Students meet with the department chairperson to plan their cor- course work. Yes. Academic records are regularly checked by the registrar's office. I don't think so. Students receive letters listing the courses, and they still need to take. Now, this is important that she. I actually wrote this down that there used to be letters, but they don't do it anymore. Always, when they give some unnecessary detail about what happened in the past and is no longer happening, there's going to be a question or like one of the answers that is wrong.、Um, so no, this is not true. Warning letters are sent. No. So student meet with the department chairperson. Correct.、Um, Why does the man mention his classmates? I'll remember, he wanted to say that some of his classmates use field work、uh, in order to make it easier for them. Uh, to qualify for intermediate, to show that it's difficult to get intermediate level credits, to emphasize the motivation to do. Okay. Now remember this whole conversation. He mentions classmates in order to show that some people do field work in order to qualify for intermediate level, but still take basic courses, right? Let's think. Two basic courses, field experience. I'm looking through my notes. He did it for the depth. He mentioned not to make it easier. Okay, let's go through every answer to explain how he obtained information about field research. He met with the、uh, department chair, and、uh, I think he f- this this is the way he found out to point out that many students like to do field research. No, to show that it is difficult to get intermediate level credits. He didn't talk about difficulty to emphasize the motivation to do f- field research in two of his courses. Yeah, he's like, other people are doing it because it's easy, but I, I am doing this for the science. This answer, okay. Why does the registrar tell the man to contact his chairperson immediately? If I remember the conversation, I try to answer the question in my head and then read the options、uh, because. Uh, the chairperson needs to call the registrar and explain that、uh, field work actually qualifies for intermediate level. The man has a limited. Oh, and they talk about the man first needs to find out if the chairperson. No, issuing a new grade might take longer than expected. And then the man. Yeah, I think the whole thing was the man has a limited time to resolve his problem because she mentions that if he takes longer than a few weeks,、uh, they might have a big problem. Yep. Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. I'm not sure what the problem is. I, I made sure I got those credits. 
unfortunately, the computer is usually pretty reliable. So I'm not sure what's going on here. What does the registrar imply when she says this? Unfortunately, the computer is usually pretty reliable. So I'm not sure what's going on here. Ah,、uh, she needs more information about the man's credits. Ah,、uh, because she's uncertain about the reliability of the computer. No, ah,、uh, she will approve the man's form despite her doubts about it. No, three is right. She needs to call someone to help her fix computer errors. Errors. No. Okay. So, how was it? After this listening part, you're gonna go on a break, and you're gonna relax, and you're gonna forget about everything. You're gonna breathe. You're gonna eat your chocolate.、Uh, then you're gonna come back earlier, and you're gonna get ready for your speaking part because you need those templates. But this is、um, a different conversation. We actually have all the templates、uh, in our TOEFL course. So if you want to take that, the link will be down below. Thank you so much, guys, for joining me for this test experience today. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I love these. Like, if you're taking your TOEFL test soon, let me know what is your main problem, what is your main struggle, so I could focus on it in my next videos. Again, I love taking tests, and I'm glad you're watching this channel to take your TOEFL test. Speaking is something that you know a lot of people are afraid of, but hopefully this video will put you at ease. Hopefully this video will make you more confident in your speech because there are a few things、uh, that you can learn before the test, and if you spend enough time preparing. Even just by watching this video, it will be a lot easier for you to take the test. Now we're gonna go through actual TOEFL speaking questions,、um, but before we dig deeper into the actual questions, I want to work with your mindset. I don't know.、Um, but anyways, I want you to stop and、uh, realize that if you're starting this TOEFL prep. That means you're done with actually learning English. Your TOEFL prep has nothing to do with learning grammar, learning new words. Yes, you might refresh some idioms in your memory because you want to use them during your writing part because this is where they really pay attention to your beautiful language. And also during your speaking part, if you say things like, "Oh, this trip was good." My friends thought it was good, and I thought it was good. Of course, that sounds a little bit boring, and of course. Test makers want you to speak using different words. Now, what you also need to remember that test makers don't want you to fail. I want to tell you the story.、Uh, I actually freaked out during my first TOEFL test because you know my life depend kind of depended on it because I needed to score 106 to get into my dream university. And during the speaking part, there was a question like talk about your city or something, something really basic. And you have 45 seconds to speak. And I was looking at the screen and I was talking. And when I was just wrapping up my answer, my brain was like, "Oh, let's add this thing." But then my brain was also like, "Let's just you know stop here." And then I ran out of time. So the way I wrapped up that answer was, uh. And that was it. And my first thought was, you know, I failed because I thought they were gonna punish me for not finishing my answer with a conclusion. Turns out that didn't really matter, and I got thirty out of thirty. So I want you to realize is that the structure of the test is super predictable. We're gonna go through it. You're gonna know exactly how the questions look. And you're gonna know exactly how to structure your answer. And it's okay if you don't finish your question number one with a conclusion. It's totally fine. But it's not okay if you use the word "good" 15 times in your answer. Try to think of alternatives, right? Also, test makers want you to sound as natural as possible. So if you pause, if you Think for a couple seconds. That's totally okay. They don't want all the students to become robots who speak as if their voice is generated by AI. No mistakes, no pauses. Everything is super nice and clean. No, they don't want that. They want real humans. So just again, relax, because when we're relaxed, our language just flows out of us. You just sound more natural. Oh, and another thing I wanted to add is that I took my TOEFL test before starting this channel. And my speech was so much worse. Anyways, let's get into it. Let's、uh, please get ready.、Uh, I need you to take a piece of paper, and I want you to take a pen because this is something you're allowed to do during the exam, and I really want you to take advantage of that. 
because you're gonna write things down. Now I'm gonna use a link that's in my description so you can go ahead and check it out later after this video. So there is a website called ETS.org. ETS is a company behind the TOEFL test and they have a free practice test on their website. This is exactly what we're gonna use for this video. We're gonna go and take the actual practice test. Now in this video, I will give you some templates, some phrases that you can learn so you can start your answers to different questions. And you can also find all of the templates that I use that my teachers have created um, on the website called LinguaTrip, which is my company where professional teachers will help you prepare for TOEFL. And I've also recorded some classes for you about my own experience. But anyways, what I want you to do is I want you to take those templates or whatever templates you have. And when TOEFL starts, you're gonna see this screen. I'm gonna look at my computer, so don't get confused. And they're gonna give you some directions for the speaking section. Now, they are the same all the time, nothing changes. So basically this is your free time. If you read the, if you read the speaking section directions before the test, then during the test, I want you to use your paper to write down templates for four questions. And this is exactly what I did during my tests. For the first question, you don't have templates. For the other questions, you do have templates. So we're not gonna do this now, just because um, also regarding templates, um, use the ones that are more natural for you. Don't try to use something really sophisticated just because you saw it on our list of templates. Don't do it because again, you want to sound as natural as possible. And they're gonna read you all of these directions and you're gonna write down your templates. Okay, now let's start with question number one. It's a question about a familiar topic. I was asked about my city or something and I always ask about something really, you know, something really familiar, something you encounter in your daily life. And here you just speak clearly, speak your heart out, no structure, just, just talk, okay? State whether you agree or disagree with the following statement. Then explain your reasons using specific details in your explanation. Learning through online courses is more effective than learning in the traditional classroom setting. If this were an actual test question, you would have 15 seconds to prepare your response and 45 seconds to record your response. Now let's answer this question together. Uh, there are definitely pros and cons to both, right? I can argue that online learning is better. You can argue that offline education is something that you strive for. Anyways, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you, just answer, okay? In my opinion, online learning is more effective than learning in the traditional environment for several reasons. Reason number one is that you can learn anything from home. You don't have to travel. You don't have to apply for a visa. You don't have to move to another country. Everything is accessible from your computer, your laptop, or your phone. The second reason is that online classes tend to be more affordable compared to offline learning. That means you can learn a lot more for the same amount of money. And reason number three is that online education is more accessible for moms. If they have to stay home with their kid, they could potentially learn something new at the same time. And this is where you can wrap up. You can say, this is why I think um, online education is better, or you can just stop right there. That's it, this is your answer, okay? By the way, it's not just me providing these answers. I also asked our teacher, Anastasia, to give feedback about my answer, whether it was well-structured, whether I made some mistakes, and overall to grade me according to TOEFL grades. She has helped so many students get over 100, so I am excited to see what she thinks about my answers. Marina's answer is effective, as she responded directly to the question in her opening thesis and presented clear arguments that support her main idea. There were no serious grammar errors, and her pronunciation and intonation were good. Rather than using reason number one, it's more natural to simply say, first, you can. Providing two well-elaborated reasons is better than giving three rushed reasons. For example, Marina could have elaborated on one of the examples by sharing a personal experience of successful online learning. Repetition is another issue. Marina repeated learn six times, online three times, and reason four times, which will be reflected in the AI report. Having two reasons here 
would have helped to avoid excessive repetition. I also recommend avoiding repetitive sentences, such as you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that, and using well-developed sentences instead. Finally, Marina should avoid taking long pauses, as they will hurt the AI score. The things that I wrote down for myself, in my opinion, this is like my super small template, in my opinion, and then one, two, three, three reasons. Again, you only have 15 seconds, so you don't really have time to write down your reasons. Just maybe think of them, okay. Reason number one, affordable. Reason number two, saves time. Reason number three, I'm a mom, so yeah, let's uh, let's say that it's, it's better for, for moms. That's it. And then you just uh, uh, speak your heart out. So this is the way you answer question number one. I highly, 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 highly recommend you to practice. Um, if you can just uh, switch on a timer on your phone and just talk about like anything, uh, a book that you've read, a movie that you watch. Why is it a good movie? Why is it a bad movie? Give two or three reasons. Why you think travel is good? Why you think travel is bad? Like whatever. Just practice those 45 second answers to time yourself and get comfortable with the overall time pressure again this exam kind of has nothing to do with real life but it's a stressful situation it's something that you train and something that you get good at if you practice now let's move on to the second question in the second question you're gonna read an article and you're gonna listen to a conversation and then you have to report on what you've heard now here I strongly suggest that you take notes and something I strongly suggest as well is that you practice taking notes in a stressful environment. Sometimes you create your own contractions for words. Sometimes people create their own symbols. I don't know, whatever you're gonna do, just do it before the exam so that it's easier for you to take those notes. You have 30 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to answer. Read the article from a university newspaper. You will have 50 seconds to read the article. Begin reading now. Now listen to a conversation between two students. Hey Sue, did you see this article? Yeah, I did. I don't think that's a very good idea. Really? You don't think it's a safety hazard, like they said? No, at least not during the day. I'm pretty sure both of those accidents happened at night, when it's harder to see cyclists. They didn't say that in the article. Oh, that does make a difference. Sure it does. Maybe at night, with low visibility, there's a safety hazard. But I don't think there's any danger in the daytime, which is when most people need to move around and get to classes. Yeah, that makes sense. Besides, it's such a big campus. If they do this, it's going to be really hard to get around. Well, we can always take the bus, I guess. But the bus is only run once an hour. That's true. They're not very convenient. No, not at all. If people have to take the bus, we'll end up sitting around waiting for the next one all the time, and we're all too busy to waste our time doing that. The woman expresses her opinion of the proposed policy change. State her opinion and explain the reasons she gives for holding that opinion. If this were an actual test question, you would have 30 seconds to prepare your response and 60 seconds to record your response. Now, when you're listening, pay attention to the reasons for the speaker's opinions. I made some notes uh, when I read the article and I also made some notes uh, when Sue was talking. Now, you need to write down some key words and phrases, opinions, and why someone had this or that opinion. Now, all of this, sounds like a typical American college. You know, in the US, for some reason, 
uh, well, no one wants to be liable for anything. I'm going to start a timer for 60 seconds and we're going to answer this question. According to the article, the university management is going to ban bicycles on campus because there have been minor accidents and the management believes that bicycles can threat students' safety on campus and they suggest that students start using buses instead of bicycles. One of the students, however, disagrees with this new policy and she has several reasons for that. Reason number one is that she thinks those accidents happen during the night when visibility is low and she states that when students can see everything during daytime there are no accidents so why ban the bicycles? Another reason why she disagrees with this new policy is that the solution that the university suggests doesn't really work for her. She mentions that buses only run once an hour and the campus is huge, which means there will be a lot of waiting and a lot of time wasted. This is why Sue doesn't like the new policy, okay? It should be good. So here you actually have the structure. Did you notice that? Uh, I mentioned what we've read in the article. I mentioned that Sue disagreed and I also gave a couple of reasons why she disagreed. And then I wrapped up. This is why Sue doesn't like this new policy. That's it. It's important to keep the reading summary to about 15 seconds. For question type two, most of the score comes from summarizing the listening task. So it would have been better to say, according to the announcement, the university will soon ban the use of bikes on campus since they are a safety hazard and the free campus bus service is an alternative way to get around. It's also possible to shorten the transition to the woman disagrees with this policy. Short and sweet. As in question one, we don't need reason number one. Let's change it to first, she thinks that. There is no need to introduce a conclusion. Marina could have used this time to add more details. She could have mentioned that people really need to get around during the day and the campus is really big. These are both details from the woman's first reason that weren't included in the answer. She could have also added, they're too busy to sit around waiting to the woman's second reason. So it's all about introducing more details from the audio. Other than that, the organization is good. The grammar and delivery are excellent. Okay, question number, how are you doing by the way? If it sounds complicated, it's okay, you practice, all right? And also something that you need to remember is that if your English is intermediate, but you want to score over 100, which means advanced on TOEFL, it is not a very realistic goal if you only have a couple of weeks, right? If your English is intermediate, but you need over 100, you need to stop your TOEFL prep now, take a general English course, improve your speaking in general, improve your vocabulary, improve your grammar, and then come back and do the TOEFL prep. If your English is advanced and you need to score over 100, all you need is like a couple of weeks to prepare for TOEFL because you just need to get acquainted with the structure of the test. You need to get acquainted with what it looks like, with the topics, with the language, like, oh, and, and then that's it. You just take the test. Okay, we're moving on to questions three and four. They're more academic and they might cover topics that you're not familiar with, like psychology, economics, biology. Biology has always been hard for me. Or like ancient history. I've never really studied ancient history. And when it's in English, it's like a double threat uh, for me. Anyways, we're all students here. So we're going to move on to question number three and four. What I suggest for these questions and for TOEFL in general, read as many academic articles as possible, uh, watch BBC YouTube videos, watch TED Talks, just to get acquainted with uh, terminology. In question three, you're going to read a passage about an academic term or a concept. Then you listen to a lecture about the same topic. You'll have 30 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds for speaking. They're not generous with their timing at all. Well, here, please take notes. Like, this is where things get a little bit complicated. Not as complicated as in reading. Reading is the hardest part for me because it's super stressful. You know, your test just starts. Speaking is easier. But if you hear some terms, write them down. If you hear some facts, numbers, write them down. And remember, this is an English language test, not a chemistry test, not a psychology test. They do not expect you to know everything on the topic. They just expect you to speak good English. That's it. All right. And next. Now read the passage from a psychology <laughs> textbook. Psychology. You have 45 seconds okay. to read the passage. Begin reading now.
Now listen to part of a lecture on the topic in a psychology class. This happens all the time with kids in schools. Say there's a little boy or girl who's just starting school. Well, they're not really used to the rules about proper behavior for a classroom. So at the beginning, they might, I don't know, interrupt the teacher, walk around the classroom when they're supposed to be sitting down. You know, just misbehaving in general. Okay, but what happens? Well, the teacher gets angry with them when they act this way. They might get punished. They have to sit at their desks when everyone else is allowed to go outside and play, and they certainly don't like that. Soon they'll learn that this kind of behavior gets them in trouble. They'll also learn that when they raise their hand to talk to the teacher and sit quietly and pay attention during class, they're rewarded. The teacher tells them she's proud of them and maybe puts little happy face stickers on their homework. Now that their behavior gets a good reaction from the teacher, the kids learn to always act this way in class and not behave the way they used to. Using the example from the lecture, explain what behavior modification is and how it works. If this were an actual test question, you would have 30 seconds to prepare your response and 60 seconds to record your response. The text. Introduces the concept of behavior modification. It states that if after some action a person experiences positive reaction, then the person will continue with these actions. However, if he or she receives negative reaction, they will modify their behavior in order to maximize positive reaction. The professor explains this concept with an example of kids who just started at school. If Kids start walking around when they're not allowed to. If they start interrupting the teacher, they get negative consequences and they don't like it. So they eventually modify their behavior. However, if they listen to the teacher, if they raise their hand when they want to answer, they get a sticker with a happy face from the teacher. They get a positive reaction, and this way they learn how to always act in a way that gets a positive reaction from a teacher. This is how the professor explains the concept. Described in the article. My notes, as always. Regarding question three, the summary of the reading text is way too long. Maria spent about twenty-five seconds on that. When fifteen is the recommended amount, it's better to say the reading is about behavior modification, which is when we change our behavior based on our knowledge of its consequences. I liked the transition to the lecture summary. Also, nice use of so as a conjunction and however as a transition. There is no need for a conclusion at the end. Instead, it's better to just include additional details from the lecture. For instance, Marina could have said, "The teacher gets angry, and students are punished," instead of just saying there are negative consequences. She could have mentioned that when they act nicely, the teacher says he or she is proud of them. Basically. A few more stray details could have been added if Marina cut the conclusion and shortened the reading summary. That would increase her topic development score from the Human Rater and probably improve the vocabulary score from the AI. The delivery remains fantastic, but it's important to watch out for pauses. They are infrequent, but if your target score is high, every bit matters. The AI score will definitely be way lower than the human score for this question. And it's entirely because of vocabulary. Marina should avoid repeating they and if they. It's possible to say when it's not permitted instead of when they're not allowed to, or start interrupting instead of if they interrupt, and raise their hand instead of if they raise their hand. Our last question, and then we're done. Listen to part of a lecture in a business class. If a consumer has to choose between two products, what determines the choice? Assume that someone, a purchaser, is choosing between two products that cost the same. Okay? If people have a choice between two identically priced products, which one will they choose? They choose the one they think is of higher quality, of course. But what does it mean for a product to be a high quality product? Well, business analysts usually speak of two major factors of quality. One factor is reliability, and the other is what we call features. So, reliability. What's reliability? Well, a product is reliable if it works the way we expect it to work, if it can go a reasonable amount of time without needing repairs. 
If a product, a car for example, doesn't work the way it should and needs repairs too soon, we say it's unreliable. So product reliability means basically the absence of defects or problems that you weren't expecting. It used to be that when people thought about product quality, they thought mainly about reliability. Today, it's different. People do still care about reliability. Don't get me wrong. It's just that manufacturing standards are now so high that we'll take cars for example. Today, today's cars are very reliable. So reliability is important, but it's not going to be the deciding factor. So if reliability isn't the deciding factor anymore, what is? Features, all those extras, the things a product has that aren't really necessary but that make it easier to use or that make it cool. For example, new cars today are loaded with features like electric windows, sunroofs, air conditioning, stereos and so forth. When people are comparing products today, they look at features because reliability is pretty much equal across the board. And that's why manufacturers include so many features in their products. Using points and examples from the lecture, explain the two major factors of product quality and how their role in consumer decision making has changed. If this were an actual test question, you would have 20 seconds to prepare your response and 60 seconds to record your response. At the beginning of the lecture, professor describes what determines consumer's choice if the cost of two products is the same. Of course, if the cost is the same, the consumer is going to choose a high quality product, and she says that a higher quality product is characterized by reliability and features. By reliability, she means that the product works the way we expect it to work. By features, she means that the product is cool. However, the professor mentions that today things have changed. And she provides examples from the car industry. Cars in general became very reliable because of manufacturing process. This is why most of consumers make their choices based on features, whether the car has a stereo or any other things that make it cool. All in all, the professor mentions that cars are more reliable nowadays, so reliability is no longer a deciding feature. In terms of the structure, I think Marina wasted too much time at the beginning introducing the general theme. I recommend saying, the lecture describes two things that help customers choose between two similar products. First, and go into detail. The score is based on your ability to summarize the two things from the lecture, so it's important to focus on those. Test takers who waste too much time at the beginning won't be able to include many details related to those two things, which is what happened in this answer. Because of the poor structure, Marina wasn't able to include many details. She barely talked about what makes a car reliable, how a reliable car doesn't need many repairs, and about the kinds of features that make a car great. So the key to this question is to focus almost exclusively on the two things mentioned in the lecture. The things I liked about this answer are an effective use of this is why as a transition, solid delivery, and good grammar. To get a high score for this question type, it's important to use transitional phrases like as a result, consequently, moreover, for example, and therefore. Focus mostly on the examples and use a mix of simple and compound sentences. Overall, this will score a solid 25. It's important to keep in mind that your TOEFL speaking score may fluctuate depending on the question topics you get. This attempt was not Marina's best. However, with more practice, she can easily achieve a score of 30, which she has accomplished previously. Here are a few tips for those who want a high score. Number one, speak fluently and without hesitation to maximize your score. This will really please the automated scoring software. Number two, use descriptive words and avoid redundancy to increase the vocabulary score given by the AI. Number three, when answering integrated questions, provide as much detail as possible from the listening tasks. For questions three and four, spend 15 seconds summarizing the reading and then move on to discussing the listening task. And number four, speak clearly and with good intonation. Make sure your pronunciation and intonation do not hinder comprehension. Marina does not have a problem with this, but I know many students who lose points due to poor pronunciation. Thank you guys so much for watching this video up to the very end. Thank you so much Anastasia for providing feedback. If you're interested in watching more classes that can help you prepare for the test, please check out the link in the description. And please, once you take the test, you know, once you get your results, come back and share them in the comment section. I'd love to hear back. 
from you. Bye!